I'm very, very excited to welcome to the stage Professor David Singh Graywall, uh, who is a professor at UC Berkeley School of Law. He will be moderating the fireside chat with our very special guest from the Federal Trade Commission, Chair Lena M. Khan. She had hoped to join us virtually, or sorry, in person, uh, but due to work and being on the East Coast, was not able to make it um, in person. Uh, we are very, very delighted to have her. Uh, and I hope I hope you get to learn a lot today. So handing it right over to you, David. Thank you. Wonderful. Hi, Lena. Can you see and hear us? I think we we're having some sound issues on her side. I think is it. I can hear you oh, all. Can hear okay. Us. Oh, great. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Well, welcome. I'm sorry you can't be here in person. It's one of those beautiful days in San Francisco that almost justifies the real estate prices. So um, <laughs> may, maybe next year. Um, so anyway, thanks very much to, for joining us. Um, you have a whole room of lawyers uh, here in person and I think a thousand people virtually online. So it's gonna be a, a great audience for our discussion. Um, I thought we might start with some questions about where we are, Silicon Valley, if that's okay. Uh, yeah, so that sounds great. I'll just say up front, uh, I'm so sorry I can't be there in person. Uh, Congress has scheduled a appropriations hearing tomorrow, so I have to appear and explain our budget request, but had been looking forward to being there in person. Um, also, just want to say what an honor it is to appear even virtually alongside David Graywall. Uh, David was my professor in law school and also uh, a mentor and a friend, and it's just uh, a real delight to, to get to be here with you. Yeah, it's nice to see you again. Um, so given that we're in Silicon Valley, what, what do you see as the FTC's role in enabling an innovation economy, um, even while pursuing antitrust goals? Maybe we can sort of start in on that. Yeah, so look, I think historically we've seen that there can be huge innovation benefits that stem from robust competition. Um, I think a lot of this stems back to you know, the historical debate between Schubert and Arrow, you know, what are the underlying market conditions that are best gonna favor innovation, right? Schubert was in the monopoly camp, Arrow was in the competition camp, and you can imagine that it could vary market by market, but as a general matter, I think we've seen how strong rivalry and strong competition can really incentivize firms to be producing breakthrough innovation. And I think that's another important distinction where you can have incremental innovation, but really the breakthrough innovation that is the paradigm shift or the introduction of a new technology oftentimes does require a significant rivalry. I think historically we've seen how instances in which we saw, you know, the unbundling of, of IBM uh, helped unleash a the American software industry. Uh, we saw how of uh, the government forcing AT&T to open up its patent vaults, uh, similarly spurred decades of innovation. And so I think we've historically seen how robust competition can be key to the paradigm shifting innovation uh, that America has really led the world in. And so that's how we view our jobs. Uh, I will say as a general matter, you know, we are charged with enforcing the antitrust laws uh, and those lay out a certain set of considerations. So we're not really in the business of picking and choosing, uh, you know, which mergers we think will allow because we think it'll allow innovation. Uh, there are, you know, serious set of clear set of instructions that Congress has given us, that courts have given us, and and that's what we follow. So I understand. So then your mandate is a sort of competition policy, but uh, and and that's not something that you're going to vary for innovation reasons, but. Um, your thought is that broadly speaking, strong and trust enforcement and innovation economy goes together, um, is, is what I heard. So wh what would, how would you respond to folks who worry that regulating uh, merger activity can in effect chill uh, innovation or have a chilling effect on it? Yeah, I mean, again, I think we've seen time and time again how it's actually promoting competition, including through stopping illegal merger activity that has been key. Um, there's a preference embedded in the laws that Congress passed and in the ways that courts have interpreted them that really express a preference for building over buying. And so there's a preference in the case law for growth through internal expansion over growth through acquisition, um, in part, I think, because there's also a recognition that it's the internal expansion um, that can be really critical in terms of 
promoting greater innovation. Um, I think we see, you know, counter arguments sometimes. And again, I think there could be space for other enforcers or other policymakers to be creating exceptions where needed. But from the FTC's perspective and enforcer's perspective, this is the tool we have. Uh, and we think oftentimes it actually promotes significant innovation. Fantastic. Let's shift to talking about um, non-competes because a different aspect of innovation that might be chilled through sort of constraints on competition is, is non-competes. And here in California, we don't, uh, you know, we don't have them to the extent elsewhere, but we saw in January that the FTC proposed a rule to ban non-competes between an employer and its workers as an unfair method of competition. I wanted to know what were your rationales for proposing the rule? Yeah, so we were really thrilled to be able to uh, introduce this proposal, uh, and it was really responding to a couple of things. Um, one is that we've all seen how non-competes have extended beyond the boardroom. So they may have been introduced in a way that was primarily governing, you know, highly paid executives, but we've seen them proliferate across the economy. So we're seeing, you know, low wage workers, uh, be it security guards or fast food workers be covered by them. Uh, we're seeing journalists be covered by them. Uh, we're seeing gardeners. I mean, really that the set of professions where these non-competes have proliferated are really across the board, across income level. And so we thought this was something that required a closer look. Uh, we've also seen over the last couple of decades, different states have gone in different directions. So California has has had a longstanding policy that has basically rendered non-compete uh, non-enforceable, but various other states have introduced additional restrictions over the last few decades in ways that have actually created a really useful national natural experiment and has led to empirical studies that have allowed researchers to actually isolate what the effects of non-competes are uh, on workers, but also on local economies. And so when you look at that empirical literature, it tells us a couple of things. Um, one is that it has shown that there actually is a effect on depressing worker wages. So our economists estimate that eliminating, eliminating non-competes uh, could, could boost worker wages to the tune of $300 billion a year. Um, but from the FTC's perspective, there's also a really important nexus to competition uh, in a macro sense. So we've also seen how the existence of non-competes can really come at the expense of new business formation um, as well as innovation. And you can imagine that, you know, that would work because oftentimes it's the very workers at existing firms that can be best positioned to go start their own company or spin off um, a particular venture. And when that activity is being restrained through the existence of non-competes, um, again, you can have a, a, an aggregate effect. Um, so those were some of the, the factors that led us to issue this proposal. Uh, the comment period just closed last week. Uh, we got around uh, 26,000 comments. So our team is, is closely studying them and will determine uh, what the right place is to land. Did the FTC take inspiration from California on this? or? How, how explicit was California's experience as a innovation economy without non-competes in, in your own? Yeah, case? I think that's a great point. I mean, certainly when you, you know, hear counter arguments about how non-competes are critical for innovation, I think California is a great illustration of how we've had a very uh, innovative local economy, state economy that has not been dependent on the existence of non-competes. Um, we, we did see, interestingly, that even in states where um, non-competes are non-enforceable. Uh, employers sometimes do still include them in contracts, and so there can actually still be a chilling effect on workers who might not actually know that they're non-enforceable. Um, but I think overall, California remains a great example of how there could be more tailored solutions like uh, non-disclosure agreements or trade secrets uh, that are more appropriate to address for, for some of the concerns that people have. I don't know if you can tell us, but something about the tenor of the comments you received of these twenty six thousand. Do you have a do you have a sense of what of what people are thinking about the rule? Yeah, we're still making our way through. I mean, I'll say as a general matter, there is enormous support uh, for this proposal. I think a lot of people have experience that they shared with us just from their day to day lives. Um, one set of uh, one set of market participants that we heard a lot from was actually healthcare workers, uh, so nurses, um, doctors who increasingly find themselves covered by non competes. Um, some doctors, in particular, shared, for example, how during the pandemic um, they actually saw how non competes were coming at the expense of healthcare being made more readily available um, because doctors were kind of stuck in place and not able to move uh, even locally to areas where there might have been a greater need for non-competes. Um, we've also 
had a public comment period. Uh, we, we hosted a public forum where we also heard from a lot of healthcare workers. So I would say that's one community that seems very engaged here. Uh, interestingly, the uh, hospital association filed a comment in support of keeping non-compete. So I think we also saw some fissures uh, within the healthcare world. Interesting. Well, speaking of healthcare, uh, last year the FTC proposed a ramped up enforcement against illegal bribes and rebate schemes that blocked patients' access to low cost drugs. And we also saw Eli Lilly, the producer of insulin medications, uh, pledge to reduce its insulin list prices by 70%. That was in the headlines a couple months ago. How did the FTC achieve this? How, how, how did you tie these things together? What was your thinking about this? Did, did this come out of the blue? Yeah, so, you know, one of the top priorities for, for the commission at this time is, is making sure that we're attacking the ways in which unlawful business practices may be inflating drug prices. Um, you know, we've seen how uh, people are literally not able to afford life-saving medicine, including insulin, because it's too expensive. And in instances where that's being driven by illegal practices, we, we think it's enormously important for us to be attacking that head on. One of the ways in which we've heard that... Um, rebates, potentially illegal rebates may be contributing is there's a system in place right now where manufacturers end up having to pay rebates to PBMs, uh, who are these middlemen in the system for, uh, and the PBMs are determining what medicines are making it to the formulary and ultimately available to patients. And so we have heard how this rebate scheme may be incentivizing manufacturers to basically make their more expensive medicines more readily available to Americans at the expense of cheaper generics. Right. Um, so this is something that we put the market on notice that we were looking at closely. Uh, we have some ongoing work streams relating to that. Uh, more generally, I think stepping back, you know, there's a fundamental bargain at the heart of our prescription drug system, which is that brand drugs are given a period of patent exclusivity that is then followed by fair and free competition uh, from generics or biosimilars. And I think there's been concern that this type of rebate scheme um, can really be coming at the expense of that core bargain and ultimately keeping those generics uh, out of reach for Americans. So this has been a core area of focus for us. In this case, Eli Lilly is not giving the market to generics. It's actually just decided to Right. If I understand to reduce its own list prices. Exactly. And, you know, one can speculate about the various uh, factors that are leading them to do that. But I think there's no question that there's been a lot of scrutiny on the pricing practices of, of the handful of companies that control this market. Fantastic. So so, you know, more competition in health policies leading to lower drug prices, more health. Let's keep with the sort of health and sort of social social welfare goals. And ask, I understand your mandate is to make markets as competitive as possible. How would you approach situations where some kind of coordination might seem to be a better way of achieving some policy ends? Um, we can think about ESG, which was mentioned a little bit ago, um, or better labor and climate outcomes. How, how do we think about coordination as opposed to competition for some kinds of social goods? Yeah, so look, to my mind, there's no question that, you know, Congress has set a general policy in favor of competition through the antitrust laws, but competition is not the only governing framework for different markets, right? We can imagine instances in which coordination might be necessary, instances in which public options might be necessary. And so I think for us as antitrust enforcers, you know, we're given the tools that we have, but we need to be humble uh, about the instances in which those tools are not applicable. Uh, so we've seen how Congress, for example, has carved out a labor exemption so that the antitrust laws are not supposed to be weaponized against workers who are looking to coordinate or organize uh, against their employers. Uh, we've seen how in the context of agriculture, uh, Congress has also created carve outs uh, allowing for that type of coordination by farmers. So, you know, we entirely defer to Congress uh, to basically identify instances in which there need to be carve outs or exemptions. And I think for us as antitrust enforcers, we need to be humble about the tools that we've been given and the domains in which they may be applicable, but the domains in which they shouldn't. One thing which we have seen, which we've spoken up about is companies coming before us and acknowledging that their merger may pose legal concerns, but 
claiming that if they make certain ESG commitments, that those should cure the illegality of the merger. And that's where we've really taken a hard line and said there is no ESG exemption to the antitrust laws. Um, and so these types of illegal behaviors cannot be cured through some promise or commitment to various types of uh, ESG uh, values. And this is what you wrote about in the Wall Street Journal a couple months back, right? In terms of the ESG, exactly. right? So how, so that would be a congressional deference principle plus uh, no ESG exception within the existing rules. Is that that's exactly? Right? And where, that's a great story. And where ESG doesn't uh, conflict with the antitrust enforcement, FTC presumably has absolutely no problem with it. Yeah, I mean, of course, if if there are no legal concerns that are in our domain, you know, we have we're not going to be wading into that. Okay. Step back. Um, what books or readings have you found inspirational? This is a question that some of us were wondering if you even have time to do uh, reading. <laughs> but what what's what's motivating you at the moment in terms of your? Um, yeah, one book that I picked up recently is uh, this new book called uh, "Data and Democracy at Work," um, and it's really taking a close. It's by Brishan Rogers, is a law professor, and it's really taking a close look at um, some of the workplace surveillance technologies that have been introduced across workplaces and the way that that's really uh, changing the nature of work, uh, exacerbating some of the power asymmetries between workers and bears. Um, so UTC has a mandate to be uh, in security, um, oftentimes that means privacy, but as we see these tools being used against workers, um, that's something that we're looking at closely as well. Oh, great. So more theoretically, uh, do you, anything inspirational or fun? That sounds very sort of work related. <laughs> um, nothing, nothing top of mind okay, uh, right now, but uh, as a, as aspire a to it. <laughs> as a taxpayer, I'm glad to see you're, 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 you're all work and no play. That's great. Um, uh, so getting back to sort of antitrust, how do you think more sort of theoretically about market concentration as a driver of economic inequality um, um, or other outcomes like economic growth? And I know that may not be formally within your mandate, but it must be something you think about. And I know the Biden administration thinks about that problem a lot. Yeah, I mean, I'll say as a general matter, I think one of the more um, interesting developments over the last decade has been that more types of um, more, more subfields within economics have started studying some of these questions around competition. Uh, for a long time, it was really industrial organization economists that were primarily studying competition and oftentimes doing through a micro lens. But over the last decade, we've seen more macro economists research this topic, labor economists, public finance economists. And I think that research has started to surface some of these more big picture interconnections. And so we've seen, for example, how labor markets are actually much more concentrated um, and that there can be a correlation between high labor market concentration and an effect on stagnant or declining wages. Uh, I think we've also seen in the aggregate how you know market power can enable price hikes uh, and also in effect be enabling a, a wealth transfer upward. So I think we have seen research, including from, uh, I believe it was the Atlanta Federal Reserve, that found that you know less market consolidation uh, correlated with areas that were generally more prosperous and had faster income growth and, and lower poverty rates. So these pockets of research, I think, are, are telling a story um, that some, you know, a summary of which is monopoly power can contribute to, or at least be highly correlated with higher rates of inequality and, and greater competition um, can can promote greater growth. So that's research that we're following closely and I think also is being looked at closely by other policymakers with additional tools in this area. So if market concentration can have some of those sort of negative effects, how do you make small businesses a, spe a specific concern of antitrust policy um, in a way that, say, a consumer focus on exclusion of rivals or something like that would leave out? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, historically, um, ensuring that independent businesses have access to markets and are not be not being squelched or shut out of the market through illegal tactics is a core concern of antitrust. 
Um, one area where we've seen a lot of concern from, from small business and independent business is in the pharmacy sector. So we've heard a lot of concerns from independent pharmacies around how the practices of some of these PBMs who have also vertically integrated, so the PBMs also have their own mail order pharmacies, um, may be suppressing their ability to, to be viable competitive players in the market. One reason why the, the independent pharmacy example is always interesting to me is because sometimes there can be a um, caricature that, you know, the small businesses are the inefficient ones. And so if antitrust is protecting their ability to participate in the market, that's really protecting inefficient companies. I think what we've seen in the context of independent pharmacies is that states that have laws prohibiting chain ownership of pharmacies and so hence have a robust independent pharmacy landscape um, can actually outcompete some of the states with that have major chains. And so we saw this, for example, during the pandemic, where the states that had strong local independent pharmacies were able to distribute the vaccine much more efficiently and much more quickly than states that were dominated by the big chains. And so I think we've seen interesting examples about how actually it's sometimes the independents who can be smaller that can actually outcompete and you know not just go toe to toe with some of the big guys. So something about sort of resilience of supplies rather than efficiency might might be something you'd look at in addition to scale. It, it, exactly. And I think this question of, of resiliency has become especially salient for us uh, over the last few years where we've seen how uh, through the pandemic, uh, you know, certain types of shocks to the system can have a much more cascading effect when you have deep concentration of production. And so thinking about how competition policy can also be important to create a system that's more resilient and less fragile uh, is also top of mind for us. So workers have come up a lot. Let, how would we make workers a subject of specific antitrust concern, independent of them as consumers, in effect? Um, I mean. Yeah, how do you think about them? Yeah, so, you know, interestingly, all the antitrust statutes talk about competition and fair competition. Uh, they don't specify the market participants that competition is supposed to benefit, right? So there's nothing in our statute that our efforts to protect just competition for the sake of uh, consumers. Workers uh, can also be extremely relevant. Um, there's also, you know, case law that says, when there is a merger that's illegal because it could substantially lessen competition with some set of market participants, that itself is enough for the law uh, law enforcers to act. We are in a position of this cross market balancing where you know benefits to don't. Um, so the FTC has been looking in its investigations to understand whether there could be harm to workers um, and that could be a basis for bringing some of these laws. We've also been uh, pursuing enforcement actions uh, in the context of non-competes. Um, so we brought a, a law enforcement action against a security company that had been in competes on its workers. Uh, we brought a, a, a law enforcement action in a highly concentrated industry where the three major players had basically locked up a lot of the talent through these non-competes. So both on the merger side, as well as through our work on non-competes, uh, we're seeing how antitrust can protect workers as well. Lena, sorry, in, we had an infrastructure problem on this end, which was you froze up a little bit at a crucial point that was really interesting when you were saying that the, that the antitrust statutes didn't specify the consumer as the sort of sole focus of competitive, of, of, of competitive aims. And I, I wanted to hear, and you froze up and it became a little garbled. And I think I can infer what you were saying from what you said later. But if you could just kind of repeat that point, because I, I, I didn't, I want to make sure I'm not, I didn't miss it. There's a bit of internet. Yeah, happy to. So, yeah. so the short of it is, I see. Okay. Um, the antitrust statutes uh, don't specify that we can only look at effects on. And so we look at the effects on all market participants, the managers, for example, where the FTC has looked at the effects, not just on patients, but also on nurses or healthcare workers. Um, and so this is a muscle that we're building in a merger context, but also, again, our work on non-competes and other, other areas. The internet keeps trying to freeze you whenever you want to move beyond the consumer welfare standard. So I, I hesitate to, <laughs> to ask about it directly, but let's talk about it directly. So if, if consumers are too narrow a class to capture all of the different concerns antitrust has, even its statutory basis and certainly in practice, how should we broaden 
beyond the consumer standard? I mean, so you've talked a little bit about that with non-competes and so on, but what are some other examples of things that have been motivating the FTC's work? Yeah, I mean, one thing that we think a lot about is the market structure at issue. Um, you know, Congress really focuses on competition and fair competition. Um, and it, there are certain ways in which just having certain presumptions can eliminate the need to be then understanding if the effects are just going to be harming consumers or workers. Uh, it's really about keeping the process and really, you know, for the FTC, See, Congress also specified that our job is to prohibit unfair methods of competition. And that word unfair is really important because I think it underscores that not all forms of competition are fair game, right? It's not rivalry for rivalry's sake, but it's actually the role of the FTC to identify what are the dimensions of competition that are fair and desirable versus the competition, the dimensions of competition that are unfair. And so that's a role that's a bit more unique. It's not just a law enforcement role, but also has a policy making component uh, that we take very seriously as well. So in that vein, what kinds of concepts, alternative concepts or new measures, if any, have you guys been working on or, or, or further developing that help to sort of assess anti-competitive behavior in those other dimensions beyond say consumer welfare? So this is an area where we've been both going back to the text of the statute, but also the under case law. Um, and so last year we put out a policy statement explaining what unfair methods of competition means. Um, and that interpretation relied on, you know, basically a century of case law. And that case law identified instances in which business practices that were, say, coercive or exploitative or predatory um, could constitute an unfair method of competition without having to show some type of end welfare effects, uh, be it on consumers or other market participants. So that's what the case law lays out. And so that's what we're, what, what we're gonna be following. And, and how do you sort of measure or operationalize that? Do you have, how, how have you been going about doing that? Do you have any? Yeah, I mean, we lay out a, a test uh, where it says, you know, if, if a business practice is, first of all, a, a method of competition, um, and then if it's unfair, uh, and the unfairness prong, again, draws on some of this case law around exploitation or coercion or predation, um, that's what we're looking at. Um, you, you know, I think it's fair to say that there isn't a hard and fast formula plugging this into and that's spitting out an outcome. It is more of a qualitative assessment as so much of the law and, and you know, legal analysis is. Right, wonderful. And so in addition to the enforcement mandate, you mentioned earlier there's a sort of policy making role that the, that the statutes give to the FTC. How do policy issues get added to your agenda and how do you prioritize among all the different things you could seek to work on? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And uh, uh, this question of prioritization, uh, one that we think about day in, day out, because we're a relatively small agency. We have a huge mandate that covers you know, the full scope of the economy. Um, I would say a couple of things. Uh, one is areas where we are hearing a lot of concerns. Um, so one thing that we've started over the last uh, year and a half is doing these public commission meetings where there's a component where anybody can sign up and come speak directly to the commission. Um, and that ends up being a really useful way to just hear from the public about what are the concerns that they're seeing day in, day out. Uh, one example here is we've been hearing from a lot of franchisees uh, about concerns that were stemming from the power that the franchisers may have over them and the practices that they're uh, deploying. So the other week we rolled out a franchise request for information um, to collect more data about the relationship between the franchisees and the franchisers and whether, whether there may be anti-competitive conduct there that should be on our radar. Um, another area recently that's been top of our mind is cloud computing. Um, so I think we've seen how as the cloud market uh, has basically focused around a handful of big players, that can lead to concerns around systemic uh, resiliency where, you know, a single outage can have cascading effects. 
Um, it also affected our work on data privacy and security. Um, and so we similar about a, a, a similar study uh, on cloud computing. So, you know, it, it's it's a, a, a dynamic uh, situation where it's partly what issues are, are coming on our radar. Um, I'll also say areas where we feel that we have a deficit of information uh, that relate to our enforcement mandate can be another area where we are putting out calls for information or doing deep market studies uh, to make sure that we're smartening up on, on particular issues. And so you mentioned earlier, you used academic uh, research on sort of non-competes and their effects. How much do you draw on policy uh, analysis that comes from sort of outside the, the agency and how much is in-house? We rely on, on the external analysis an enormous amount. I um, mean, we have great staff internally. We have around 100 PhD economists. Uh, we just last month launched a new office of technology where we're bringing on data scientists, data engineers, AI specialists. So we're looking to build more of this capacity in-house, but there's no doubt that uh, there's only so much we can do. Uh, these are also people that are spending their time on our enforcement cases. and so relying on the outside world for research ends up being uh, quite critical for us. Well, that seems like it might be a, a good place because uh, I've, I've backed you into a corner saying that academic work is important for you, which as a professor feels like <laughs> it's my, 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 my bailiwick. But anyway, I wish we could uh, be having this conversation in class. It's so great to hear you again and think about these things with you. But I think we're out of time. And so um, is there anything that you want to say in particular to uh, to us before we let you go? No, I think you uh, a lot of this. I think it's an enormously exciting time for our viewpoint. Uh, we are fully activating all of the tools that Congress gave us. I think we've seen a lot of pressing problems that deserve our attention, and we're really pursuing this work with a tremendous degree of urgency. Well, thank you for taking time out of that urgent work to talk to us today. Great. Thanks so much. Here.